And that was a story about Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan today. It was funny because nobody uh, thought that that was an issue to be paying any attention to, and nobody thought there was any real traction to that. And it pissed me off because I knew I wasn't wrong. I had covered that war from the beginning, and I had watched what was happening on the battlefield, and I have never missed a year of the Afghan war. I've been back every single year. Sometimes I stayed for a year and didn't come home. You know, and, um, and I knew that we were being lied to, and I knew that the American people were being misled. And when it comes to issues that I care about, like issues of national security, I don't think that politics um, should dictate your national security policy. And I, I, I don't know a journalist that likes being lied to. If Al-Qaeda was truly what drew us to Afghanistan after 9-11, then it was a, a, we, we felt it was a fair and legitimate question to be asking of American leaders, what is the state of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan? And you would have heard bandied around the number 50 all the time. Every, you know, the head of the CIA, other people, officials in the administration, love to tell us today that there are only 50 Al-Qaeda left in Afghanistan. And the impression that we're given is that they're one drone strike away from obliteration. And that's just simply not true. They know it's not true. And what we had to do was to set about investigating it to discover what was the truth. Of course, we, we turned to the official record, and that meant reading you know, and researching everything that anyone in the administration or a position of authority had had to say about Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan over the last few years. Every counterterrorism expert in the field, we went to the agencies, you know, obviously to the CIA, to wherever we could go. We went to the think tanks. We went to anyone who was anyone who could possibly know about this. And we kept hearing the same thing time and time again, is that, you know, there's no political reason for anybody be, to be talking to you about this right now because if we talk about Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, doesn't that undermine the argument for leaving? And, and that was really a problem for us. At one point, we even had in writing from the U.S. military that Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan was off the table, that they weren't even prepared to talk about that, which only made us more determined to talk about it because when, you, when you're constantly knocked down, when people constantly try to bury you, and you have the sense that you're onto something, you know that it's worthwhile. It's, it's hard not to doubt yourself, and you know that at the end of the day, you're going to be standing alone on the 50-yard line in the Super Bowl, right? I mean, you're on the premiere of 60 Minutes, and you're saying something that nobody in the administration wants to hear. And a lot of people in the United States military don't want out there, because there were a lot of people who weren't helpful to us in the pursuit of this story. So you better not overstate it. You better know that what you're doing is correct. There's been a narrative coming out of Washington over the last few years, many of it driven by Pakistani lobbying money and um, by Taliban apologists. One of my favorite things to read about is how the Taliban today is so unlike the Taliban of 2001. There are just a more moderate, gentler, kinder Taliban who just can't wait to see women in the workplace occupying you know, an equal role in society and you know, great economic prosperity for all of Afghanistan and don't really want to take us back 3,000 years into that terrible, terrible place that I witnessed in 2001 when I went with the Afghan soldiers who retook Kabul from the Taliban. You know, it's such uh, nonsense. And every now and then you'll read someone in a British paper, or someone in an American paper, someone saying to you that they've been talking to the Taliban and Taliban wanted to go to peace talks and they, they you know, they're, they're ready to renounce their links with Al-Qaeda. There's really the, the theory is if you pack up and go home from Afghanistan, the problem is over. The Taliban just want their country back. They've got no problem with you. And, and we can just, we can stop wasting billions of dollars and, and American lives in Afghanistan. And we can turn our backs on this, um, this war that has really been a waste of our time. That's amazing to me that that's where we are today. Because, I, I mean, not only do I remember the promises that were made, which is fine, you don't want to keep your promises, that's, that's, that's politics, I guess. But <laughs> to think that there's any similarity between this and Vietnam is ridiculous. The Viet Cong didn't care what you did when you went back to America. The Viet Cong weren't fighting for an Islamic caliphate. The Viet Cong didn't have a global struggle. And it's amazing to me that we constantly ignore what Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and Haqqani and all these groups tell us every day in their own newspapers, in their own statements. They share something. 
they share an idea. Al-Qaeda is not an organization. You don't have to have a card, a membership card, or a badge, or something. Our way of life is under attack. And if you think that's government propaganda, if you think that's nonsense, if you think that's warmongering, you're not listening to what the people who are fighting you say about this fight. In your arrogance, you think you write the script, but you don't. There's two sides, and we don't dictate the terms. And in fact, after 11 years of war in Afghanistan, where we're surrendering, rushing for the exits as fast as we can, not only do we not dictate the terms, but we have less power to dictate anything on the world stage. And we now face an enemy that former U.S. Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who, whose interview didn't make this piece, but we did talk to him, and, and he said, we've killed all the slow and stupid ones. The ones that are left are more committed, and they didn't become any kinder or gentler in the last 11 years. And he's absolutely right. They, another thing Ryan Crocker said was, we think we've won the campaign when they haven't even begun to fight. And that's right. I, I can't stand that there's a major lie being propagated about the real situation. I don't care who's in power. I don't care who's behind it. That I went there, you know, he was kind of like the invisible general. People don't know a lot about General Allen. But I walked away from that interview thinking if my son was in the United States military in Afghanistan, I would probably want him to have a leader like that because he had the courage of his convictions. And what you didn't see in that story is him at the end saying, um, where I said to him, I get the feeling, General, this is personal to you. And he said, I didn't, I didn't come here. I came here fully expecting this would be the last job that I ever did. This is completely consuming. I almost can't remember ever having been anywhere else. And what's amazing to me is we, we ask that of people, and we send them to war, and we send people to die. And if anyone has, wants to know what your tax dollars also pay for, because some, we were talking about tax dollars earlier, go and visit Walter Reed sometime, or Bethesda National Medical Center, as it's called. Or take, a, you know, take your family to Arlington Cemetery and see the fresh graves that have been dug that are not that those soldiers haven't been put in the ground by Hamas and other people on the terrorist list. They've been put there by Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and Haqqani and the Pakistani government and all those people who want to destroy the United States, the West, and our way of life. If you fail to identify the ideological component to this fight, if you fail to identify what your enemy is really fighting for, if you lie about who they really are, I don't see how you can possibly have the right strategy. And what we wanted to do was to leave people with a sense of something that mattered, something that is going to resonate, something that I honestly believe will come back to haunt us, um, as it did before. It's almost like Groundhog Day in Afghanistan, that, you know, just as Charlie Wilson's war, right? Charlie Wilson said, <laughs> you know, if you turn your back on Afghanistan now, you're going to pay a price. And we didn't believe them. And then there was 9-11. And when I look at what's happening in Libya, there's a big song and dance about whether this was a terrorist attack or a protest. And you just want to scream, for God's sake. Are you kidding me? The last time we were attacked like this was the USS Cole, which was a prelude to the 1998 embassy bombings, which was a prelude to 9-11. And you're sending an FBI to investigate. I hope to God that you're sending in your best clandestine warriors who are going to exact revenge and let the world know that the United States will not be attacked on its own soil, that its ambassadors will not be murdered, and the United States will not stand by and do nothing about it.